All right, let's get into the first controversy. We're talking about eggs and dietary cholesterol, or as Dr. Tom Campitelli calls them in his the best New Zealand accent, best Kiwi accent, eeks. Eeks. So what's the controversy here? Well, the controversy is that the public and many health professionals are still arguing about whether or not we should limit dietary cholesterol in our diets. And eggs are the scapegoat because that's one of the most common foods that people eat that has dietary cholesterol in them. So why or where did this controversy come from? Well, the hypothesis was that dietary cholesterol directly and dramatically drove blood cholesterol levels up thereby increasing the risk of heart disease. And this is as far back as the 1960s per the guidelines issued by the American Heart Association. It wasn't until the 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines that an upper limit of dietary cholesterol was removed from the guidelines. Uh, and then if you look at the 2020 to 2025 guidelines, they say to keep dietary cholesterol as low as possible. Mm -hmm. So they reverted back to that. And then the 2025 to 2030 dietary guidelines, well, their scientific consensus doesn't even address dietary cholesterol at all, not even in the scientific, scientific consensus at all. So it's clear as mud in the dietary guidelines uh, from a dietary guideline standpoint, and not that anyone reads or follows these guidelines anyway, but eggs seem to get caught in the crossfire due to their cholesterol content. Um, there have been a number of studies with different methodology and different results about whole eggs and whether they're, quote, good or not, which have been poorly reported by the mainstream media. Now. If you talk about eggs or dietary cholesterol or the social media, whether it's uh, any other place, controversy abounds. Eggs are good or they're bad, or maybe it's just the yolk that's bad, or dietary cholesterol is terrible for you versus limiting cholesterol may be terrible for you because many hormones require cholesterol to make. So we're going to get to the bottom of this, try to come up with a consensus here. Uh, but Dr. Baraki, when you hear about you know, people saying, look, you, you, can't, you can't limit dietary cholesterol because hormones – is it just eye roll right, right to the back of your head or like? Or I do happens? my best to, if, it, if there is an eye roll, I try to keep it internal and not uh, visible to the, to the party with whom I'm engaging is that's a poor way to uh, enact belief change as we have learned from some of our favorite resources here. <laughs> but, you know, it just uh, to, similar to the Quack Watch segment, it illustrates that this person is probably not an expert in this area and they may well be deriving these uh, narratives from, you know, certain uh, internet and social media resources and things like that. And it's likely that they're relatively entrenched in their position, although sometimes that's more open to, to being changed. So, you know, in that conversation, I might ask, you know, what that's based on or where that comes from and, and actually see if the person's open to a conversation on it. But in general, you know, the cholesterol derived hormones are synthesized by their respective cells, the, the endocrine organs that, that make those things, but all the cells of our body, can make all the cholesterol they need in order to do these things. And so there is a difference in the uh, different compartments of the body where we can find and measure cholesterol levels. So I think that people, you know, have a very inaccurate understandings of blood test interpretation. I think that we've talked about that at length uh, before on the, on the podcast, but the blood is just one compartment of the body. Just because you can measure something in the blood, it doesn't tell you you know, the entirety of everything about that substance in the person's body. It can be in the blood. It can be in adipose. It could be in cerebrospinal fluid. It could be in urine. It could be in saliva. It could be, you know, and all of these things are different body fluids or different body compartments where we can measure things. So, you know, I can't just do a test in your blood for meningitis, for example, because that's a different compartment. So I have to go into that compartment and sample that fluid and test that if I want to get a sense of it. And so there's cholesterol in the blood, there's cholesterol inside our cells, there's cholesterol in our cell membranes, there's cholesterol, like the, one of the biggest pools that nobody even realizes is like red blood cells carrying around, like within the red blood cells and the red blood cell membranes that we don't actually measure when we're measuring blood cholesterol levels, because that's when we're measuring lipoprotein concentrations and what they're carrying in terms of cholesterol mass. So the point here is that the, the, it's easy to weave a simple sounding narrative to say some hormones come from cholesterol. And so you want more cholesterol in your blood so your body can make hormones. And there are so many, you're, you're like not just leaping, you're like triple jumping over biological <laughs> facts that are very important here to, to consider when you're trying to come to these kind of conclusions and make recommendations on it. Yeah, you've left, you've left uh, Earth's orbit. Yeah. You're now in outer space. That's how big yeah. of the leap that you've been, you've been taking. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's come up with a consensus here about dietary cholesterol and, you know, by proxy, eggs 
So the effect of dietary cholesterol, so it's just cholesterol in the foods that we eat or, or theoretically things that we drink on serum or blood cholesterol levels as carried by the lipoprotein, so like LDL, HDL, et cetera, well, it's nuanced. And it comes down to this other ratio. And I look, these are going to be like long words, but I want you guys to follow along here. So there is a ratio called the P to S ratio, polyunsaturated to saturated fat ratio. And this is calculated on the dietary pattern a person habitually eats. Now, the target would be 1.0 or better, where it's great or optimal if you're a biohacker, it would be about 2.0 or higher. The typical Western diet is 0.5. Or so, sometimes lower. Some studies have measured as low as 0.3 in uh, modern times in the United States. So when the ratio is low, that means the person is consuming low amounts of polyunsaturated fats and high amounts of saturated fat. Uh, there is a more significant effect of dietary cholesterol on blood cholesterol levels. So that, again, let me re restate that. If this ratio is low, you're not consuming a lot of polyunsaturated fats are consuming a high amount of saturated fats, there is a more significant effect of how much dietary cholesterol you eat per day on your blood cholesterol levels as measured by things like LDL, for example. When the ratio is high, so lots of polyunsaturated fats, low levels of saturated fat in the diet, this effect is much smaller. It's not to really say that there's no effect, although some studies have shown minimal uh, uh, effects here, but the evidence overall going back long periods of time before uh, you and I were around, uh, Dr. Baraki, does indicate that basically going from no cholesterol in your diet to higher amounts does impact uh, your blood cholesterol levels, but just maybe not that much, and maybe not to a nefarious sort of clinical effect if you're consuming a lot of polyunsaturated fats compared to saturated fats. So overall, this effect is sort of complex. And if I had to like tie this together, and I'll get your take on this too, Dr. B, that if somebody's dietary pattern is rich in polyunsaturated fats, so from vegetables, fish, nuts, et cetera, whatever, and low in saturated fat. I really don't care what their dietary cholesterol levels are unless it seems to me that they're like a hyper absorber of dietary cholesterol, for example, or there's some other reason that I'd want to limit it. I just, I'm less concerned, right? And so at that point, I'd be like, this is probably where we, not where we'd want to focus our efforts. I'd probably focus on like dietary fiber, potentially mm -hmm. medical mm -hmm. management. If, if somebody's mm -hmm. at high risk of heart disease, does that kind of jibe with the, your understanding of this? Yeah, I wanted to add some of the clarifications uh, that, that have been baked into this discussion so far, because I think that perhaps in, in our efforts around public messaging on this, I think sometimes the message has gotten maybe a bit um, uh, potentially over, oversimplified or, or has come across in a way to say that there's essentially never any significant impact of dietary cholesterol on blood cholesterol levels, and that's actually not entirely accurate. There is a lot of context around it that matters, and then even within that context, uh, I think that there, for most people, as it relates to their cardiovascular risk management, there are probably more important or stronger levers for us to be pulling on. And so there actually is, or there would be a clinical situation in which I could envision myself addressing somebody's dietary cholesterol levels, but it is almost never the first or second thing that I'm assessing, right? So I'm much more likely to get a sense of what's the person's, you know, I, I'll take a, you know, thorough dietary history. And from that, try to derive my gestalt about their P to S ratio. Like, are they consuming tons of high saturated fat uh, uh, foods or foods uh, with fats, saturated fats derived from uh, animal sources most commonly, uh, but also some, some other ones as well, and trying to shift that pattern into an unsaturated direction. That would be a higher priority uh, because I think that's likely to have a bigger impact on their on various outcomes, including their blood lipids, but also several other things. And then I'm aggressively trying to work on the dietary fiber piece, as we talked about in the last section as well. So aiming to get people to increase their intake of certain fruits and veg and legumes and, you know, uh, uh, higher fiber whole food sources. And if I've worked on all those things, I have an appropriate energy balance. I have appropriate, you know, physical activity, insulin sensitivity, sleep situation. I'm like attacking all the lifestyle pieces as hard as I can. And I have their dietary patterns set up the way that I think is, you know, reasonable. And they're still running, you know, higher than we'd like um, on some of their, their blood panels. Then I might, you know, if there somehow still is a residual dietary source of cholesterol that is like a significant, then I might actually target that. But that's a, that's a later on step. Um, because I do know that going from some intake down to minimal, down to zero, for example, uh, does actually have an impact on blood levels, but it's just that that impact is not so large as to justify it as like a leading intervention uh, right off right off the bat, unless somebody really wants to. And if they do, then fine. Uh, if they wanted to, uh, 
uh, again, if they said, I'm going to go to a zero cholesterol diet or something, it's like, okay, I mean, I, I want to make sure that we still are consuming a generally well-rounded and varied, varied diet here, but I would not have concerns, for example, of, oh, your, your hormones are about to tank or something like that, unless you go into like a, you know, a massive calorie deficit or something, but then it's not from <laughs> lowering your dietary cholesterol piece. It's from the overall energy situation, which certainly can have an impact on hormones and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so to move on to eggs, so eggs, which do contain a decent amount of dietary cholesterol, are just part of a broader dietary pattern, just like any other type of food, which the dietary pattern being more predictive of health than any singular food that somebody may consume. So whole eggs and or egg whites can be part of a healthy dietary pattern. Um, I am, again, not really concerned about the, quote, high cholesterol that's in eggs or really anything else if somebody's P to S ratio is really, really good. Um, again, it may be a, a step that you'd want to take to remove those sources of dietary cholesterol, but that's way down the line. And I don't even know that it would be part of like this optimization thing for somebody who's otherwise healthy. It'd be more of like a, look, man, we're really pulling strings here. <laughs> and, and honestly, for a person like that, they'd have to be very, very against taking a medication to, to further like optimize the risk, which I think would have a much bigger effect. And look, we don't get paid anything from pharma for saying this, but it's just like, look, if, you, if you're pulling out all these stops in your diet and your lifestyle to try mm -hmm. to like optimize mm -hmm. your risk of, you know, not having any sort of uh, major adverse cardiac event, medication is probably going to have a bigger bang for your buck than the dietary cholesterol piece. Plus, like if you love eggs. I don't, you know, I mean, like, I'm just saying, like, your quality of life may be, may be better that way. But if someone doesn't want to take medication, they really want to avoid them for whatever reason, that's fine. I'm happy to honor that and, and modify the diet accordingly. But that's, it's just a smaller effect. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, one little caveat that this brought to mind when you, since you bring up medications is if it were true that dietary cholesterol had zero impact whatsoever on blood cholesterol levels, then ezetimibe would not do anything ezetimibe is a drug that inhibits intestinal absorption of cholesterol, right? So that's one side of the equation. So clearly there's some relationship there. However, if dietary cholesterol was this massive driver of blood lipid regulation and cardiovascular risk, then ezetimibe would have a much larger effect than it actually does. So ezetimibe's uh, effect, broadly speaking, uh, in like, you know, unselected uh, kind of population level studies and things like that mean it what the reason I caveat it that way is not like specifically stratifying people by hyper absorbers or not, for example, broadly speaking, the effect of azetamibe is on the modest size. I still use it often, but I use it in higher risk patients or in those who have like statin intolerance, or I want to use like low dose combination therapies, things like that. But looking at it this way, I think helps to kind of uh, uh, clarify the controversy here in that there's some relationship between them but it is also modest. And then there are some people who seem to be like, you know, these hyper absorber phenotypes for whom ezetimibe is likely to have a more potent effect on their blood lipids and potentially subsequent cardiovascular risk. Although that kind of assessing that and, uh, you know, that sort of precision prescri prescribing approach is not currently like kind of standard, standard of care, I would say in, in practice, if I have, I, I'm most often starting it in like the highest risk patients, but I've in recent years started to use it more often in low dose combination therapy with folks. Yeah, you would also predict azetamide to have a smaller effect on an individual who has is consuming a lot of polyunsaturated fats compared to saturated mm -hmm. fats. You know, yes, totally. But uh, uh, last two things I wanted to say: dietary cholesterol intake has basically no clinically significant effect on hormones. <laughs> uh, nearly every cell in the body can make cholesterol, and it's particularly the tissues that make hormones. It's not the rate limiting step in hormone production. Um, instead, that's like the trophic signals you get to those tissues from like your pituitary gland, other sort of organs. And uh, overall, I would have people focus on the dietary pattern, limit saturated fat from red meat and most processed foods, get most of your dietary fats from fish, nuts, non-butter, dairy sources, and plant-derived oils. And dietary cholesterol is generally a lower concern for most with, in this context, this dietary pattern. Um, for each one of these controversial questions, I've put together what I consider to be some of the best resources, like links to studies, and you can read those. And, uh, you know, it, it, you're doing your own research, but I'm, I'm, help, I'm, help, I'm helping, helping <laughs> get, get to the right sources. 